this bright, sunny November morning. And uh, lots to remember coming up. Don't forget, next week after church, we have our Thanksgiving carry-in. Uh, be right after church downstairs. Uh, we're looking forward to that and uh, the fellowship that that brings. Uh, but I also wanted to just share uh, a passage that was giving me a little bit of hope this week. And it's from Luke chapter 4, and this is Jesus uh, going to the synagogue and essentially giving his uh, first recorded sermon. And oftentimes when uh, teachers and, and rabbis would, would give their first sermon, it'd be, what are they here for? What's their purpose? And Jesus shares this, uh, and we'll start in verse 14. It says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has appointed, anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And just as Jesus was preaching to them in that time, he still gives us hope, freedom for the oppressed, and uh, sight to the blind. And I think about this first song that we sing, uh, you know, what's the point of a lighthouse to be able to guide us in, in storms? and in the darkness to lead us to safety. So let's go to God in prayer this morning. Father God, we thank you for this day, for this time you've given us to praise and worship you. God, we thank you for the gift of worship and, and the gift of songs that uh, we can join together, that we can sing these truths uh, that you have brought to us through your scripture, through your wisdom. And God, we pray that whatever fears, whatever worries, whatever anxieties we're carrying with us today, we lay down at the foot of the cross and praise you in spirit and in truth. It's in, in your son's precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we begin in worship. In my wrestling and in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea Whoa. you are the peace in my troubled sea in the silence you won't let go in the questions your truth will hold your great love will lead us through you are the peace in my In my troubled sea, my lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness, I will follow you. Oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse, I will trust the promise. You will carry me safe to shore. Brightest, you will lead us through the 
your faithfulness, O God. You 
have chosen me Who oh, love has called my name Now I've been born again Into your family Your blood flows through my veins Now I'm no longer so thankful that through all of our faults, through all of our mistakes, all of our failures, that you still call us your children. And God, we do know that you also call us to repentance, to turn away from the sins in our life that, that pull us apart from you. And God, that you also don't uh, leave us alone, that you, you are there with us. You sent your spirit here to dwell in us, to give us wisdom to help bring us peace and hope and joy that could never be possible without you. So God, we pray that as we're, as we're here today, as we sing these praises, as we take communion together, as we hear from your word, and as we depart uh, with the encouragement and, and love that only uh, you could truly bring uh, through your people. And God, we, just, we pray that we leave here as better followers of you. It's in your son's precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, church. Um, it's communion time here at Pleasant View. And um, we, if, if you did not pick up one of these in the back, you will have a moment that you can do that and we'll... I'll give a, a meditation on communion, and then we'll have a, a moment of reflection and silence, and then uh, we'll, we'll partake of the emblems as one body of believers all at one time. Um, my meditation, I wanted to share an experience I had going to a campus minister's retreat um, where um, the campus ministers throughout Michigan um, all met at this one retreat spot at a, at a camp, and uh, it was a good time to just hang out and do things that are not so serious. But one of the things that we did was we actually had a, a pastor from a local church come in to give a workshop on forgiveness, which is cool that we get a little bit of devotional time where we're thinking about godly things and whatnot. But it kind of unfortunately turned out that this man 
at best, he poorly communicated what he was trying to say. At worst, um, did not understand biblical forgiveness, and, and I don't think he should continue teaching his workshop, but um, <laughs> he had a section on kind of God's forgiveness, vertical forgiveness, and then he had a section on forgiving each other, horizontal forgiveness, human to human. The section on God's forgiveness was fine. Um, it was from the Bible, but when we got to the section on how we should forgive other humans, it just didn't seem to follow. And it went a little bit like this. He suggested that when we're wronged by someone, we should just tell ourselves whatever story we can tell ourselves in order to kind of fill in the gaps as to why the other person might have done that, even if it's not true, even if we're just making it up. Um, yeah, some of you are, are laughing. It didn't really make good sense. And then the other thing was that simultaneously, at the, he didn't explain how you do this at the same time as the other thing he was telling us to do, but simultaneously you're supposed to um, basically take responsibility or take fault for everything you can regarding that wrongdoing that someone does to you. If, because if you take 100% of the fault, it becomes easier to forgive the other person, right? If it's all your fault. And so you see that this is just silly because not only are there lots of instances where someone does wrong to you and it's not really your fault, but also because at this point it seems like you're just trying to avoid forgiving the person because you are trying to alter reality to see that they never really sinned against you in the first place, right? And that's not really biblical forgiveness. What is biblical forgiveness as, as I see it? Uh, Colossians 2 verses 13 and 14 go like this. Paul says, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. What I get from that is that God is a good judge who is very capable of judging correctly. Um, and... Unfortunately for us, that means that he sees our sin. He doesn't trick himself into thinking that we never sinned. He doesn't tell himself whatever story to fill in the gaps. He doesn't take the fault for our sin. God knows it's not his fault that we have sinned against him, right? None of that really lines up with God's forgiveness to us. And yet, um, God sees our sin, sees our hopeless condition, and he makes us alive through Christ Jesus by choosing to cancel our legal indebtedness to him that we have because of our sin against him. How did he forgive us? He sent his son Jesus to this earth to live a sinless life and yet still take on the punishment. See, Jesus does end up with the punishment of our sin, but he doesn't fail to acknowledge that it was our sin in the first place, and we shouldn't fail to acknowledge that either. Um, that's what the good news of Jesus is, is that we really were guilty, but Jesus takes on the punishment. Isaiah 53 says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We serve a God who knows exactly how short we fall of his glory. He doesn't trick himself into believing that we're actually pretty good people. He knows how short we fall, and yet he still chooses to save us through his son, Jesus. That's the good news. And that's what we remember here at communion time. It's where we remember um, Jesus's uh, body broken on the cross. That when we look at the bread, we think about that. When we look at the juice, we think about uh, his blood that he spilt to take on our legal indebtedness that we owed to God. And so that's what we remember here at communion time. Let's take a few moments of silence and prayer and um, I'll come back and lead us in partaking at one time.
Well, at this time, um, let's take the bread, which represents Jesus' body broken on the cross and partake as one body of believers. Jesus' body broken on the cross for us. And the blood poured out for us. Let me pray for us. God, we thank you for your just and righteous actions. If we did not serve such a merciful God and if you were not so um, gracious to us, we would be in a lot of trouble. But Lord, you've given us Jesus Christ to take on our punishment and um, to free us. We're no longer slaves to sin. And so we thank you so much for everything that you have done for us. We remember that at this time and we thank you for it. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for providing meals for us after Blake's surgery. Thanks for making sure I always had a ride to chemo. And thank you for helping me through this difficult season in my life, God. Thank you, God, for teaching me to be a strong single dad. Dear God, thank you so much for giving me this new job. I love it. Thanks for sending Jeff to take my shift last week so I could be with my family. For keeping me company on the first day of school. Thank you, God, for helping us get that bill paid. Thank you, God, for the clothes on my back. For giving me the courage to speak the truth. Thank you for forgiving me. For making my day better. For giving my life a melody. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for every single day. One final thing, God. Thank you for always loving me, no matter what. As we're drawing closer to Thanksgiving, of course, next Sunday we'll be having our Thanksgiving meal and uh, our time of fellowship right after the services. Hopefully all of you are planning on coming. Uh, if you're bringing something, I might remind you to bring a little bit extra because hopefully uh, we'll have a lot of our college students staying with us also and we don't want them to go home hungry. So anyway, I uh, hope you plan on staying. You know, as you look through Scripture... There's a lot of parables, uh, there's a lot of accounts of different encounters uh, that Jesus had with various individuals. And we know uh, that in that three-year span as he walked here on earth uh, in his ministry, there had to be so many other encounters uh, that we don't read about, just not enough room in Scripture, uh, volumes it would take, uh, no doubt, to record all those accounts. So why? Why? Why were certain ones chosen and preserved for us so that we could read from the New Testament, we could see those accounts, and learn from those accounts? Well, one uh, that we're going to look at today is the story of the ten leopards. And I I want us to look at what does their gratitude or lack of gratitude uh, tell us about them, and hopefully... It will tell us a little bit something about ourselves also. September 1923, um, many of you know Jeff Streit. 
Uh, he is a phenomenal individual for illustrations. I love reading his newsletter and talk with him every so often. And I asked him one time, I said, all those illustrations you have, unbelievable. Well, he sent me a, a junk drive uh, with all of them on there, which I appreciate greatly. But this is from him. September 1923, a devastating earthquake rocked the islands of Japan. And just in the city of Tokyo, it destroyed nearly 75% of all the buildings. The New York Tribune called the earthquake undoubtedly the greatest disaster in recorded time. It was estimated that nearly 300,000 people died. 2.5 million were left homeless. Jap Japan was so devastated by disease and despair that it seemed like they'd never recover. But then help came. It came from the United States. Food, clothing, medical supplies, volunteers came by the shipload. The American Red Cross collected $10 million from the citizens of the United States to help Japan, and the Japanese people were grateful. They even put their gratitude into writing. Their very words that they wrote were, Japan will never forget. But they did, didn't they? We know that. Less than 19 years later, the American ships of mercy were forgotten. December 7th, 1941, Japanese planes were sent to Pearl Harbor to wreak death and destruction. How could they forget? In such a short period of time, and all that was done for them, but yet turn around and turn their backs on that, forget that, and attack those who gave them the most help. Well, in our story today, our account today in Scripture, we're going to read of the ten lepers that Jesus healed. I'm sure uh, you're familiar with it. You've probably heard Sunday school lessons about it and probably sermons. He sent them to see the priest. And you remember, while they were on their way, they were cleansed. No doubt they were grateful because Jesus had delivered them from one of the most terrible fates one could have back during that time. According to Old Testament law, lepers were required to live outside the city. They were literally quarantined. They were required to keep a safe distance from everyone else so that they wouldn't touch anyone and make them unclean. Uh, they were unclean both physically and spiritually. A leper was required to keep a distance of six feet between others. Sounds familiar to something we went through a while back. Including their family members, Leviticus chapter 13 said the person with such an infectious disease like leprosy must wear torn clothes, let his hair be unkept, cover the lower part of his face and cry out, unclean, unclean, when they came close to anyone. As long as he had this infection, he remained unclean, must live alone and outside the camp. They were literally, totally outcast, totally ostracized from society, from neighbors, from friends, from family. It was a devastating and a very lonely life. And then these 10 lepers met Jesus. They came to Jesus, no doubt, because they had heard of what he had been doing, of the healings, the raising from the dead, the miraculous events that surrounded this miracle worker. So they came to Jesus anticipating that he would heal them. And he did. And I suspect they were kind of grateful, but as you read this account, only one out of the ten came back and personally thanked Jesus for the healing. The others, they didn't come back. It seems like they had forgotten about it. Let's read that account from Scripture, starting in Luke 17, verse 11. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priest. And they went. They were pleased, cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Remember that. That's important. Jesus asked, Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. Now, when we read that account, we, we have to ask ourselves, how could they forget what had just happened to them? Why didn't the other nine go back 
and personally thanked Jesus for cleansing them of this most horrible disease. Some commentators said, well, maybe they didn't forget. Maybe they just thought they had gotten well anyway. Maybe Jesus just showed up the right time. You remember, Jesus really didn't do anything to him. He didn't touch him. He didn't make any mud out of spittle and put it on their eye. He didn't do anything like that. He just simply said, you go see the priest. Because if a person was clean of leprosy, before he was permitted to rejoin society, the priest had to declare him cured of the disease. Jesus said, go see the priest. They still had the leprosy, but as they were going to see him, they were healed. Now, another said one of the lepers might have been waiting to see if the cure was real, if it lasted. Another maybe thought he'd go back and see Jesus later at a more convenient time, but he just never got around to it. Still another decided that he never really had leprosy to begin with. It just kind of looked like it. Another said, I probably would have gotten well anyway. One might have said, well, the priest is the one responsible for this because I was headed to the priest when I was healed. Another might have said, any rabbi could have healed me. Another might have thought, well, I was already improved. Now, these are interesting suggestions, but I think it goes a little deeper than that. Maybe in the back of their minds, like a lot of people today, don't really want to give God credit or thanks or anything like that because they think, well, I'm going to have to make some kind of a commitment because of this blessing God has given us. They might have thought, now wait a minute, we've heard about what Jesus did in other circumstances when he healed people. He required something from them, and we don't want to take that next step. Uh, Matthew chapter 8, verses 21 and 22. Another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me and let the be dead bury the dead. Matthew 9, 9, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting in a tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. Then in Matthew 10, 32 through 39, he told his 12 disciples, whoever acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my father in heaven. Because whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. <clears throat> Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Constantly, Jesus was saying after a blessing, follow me, follow me, follow me. Maybe those other nine had no desire to follow Jesus. Now, as a little bit of a sidebar here, a lot of people read that scripture and say, really? God wants me to hate my father, my mother, my mother-in-law? It's, it's not what he's saying here at all. What he's saying is, and um, sometimes as preachers, and as Christians, we struggle with this. We identify something as sin. It is wrong. But then all of a sudden, a family member gets involved with it, which we have identified as sin. Do we change our definition of sin just because a family member is not involved in that, and we don't want to cause any problems. We don't want to ruffle the water. No. And I believe that's exactly what Jesus was talking about here. If it's wrong, it's wrong, no matter who is involved with it. And sometimes that does turn. One of my best friends in college, when he came to Johnson, his parents disowned him because he had left their faith, so to speak, to become a Christian and go into ministry. It was tough. That's what Jesus is talking about here. You don't hate, but you hate the sin no matter who's involved in it. You can still love the person, but you cannot condone what's going on. But anyway, Jesus was constantly calling people to commit to him, to surrender to him, to take up their cross and follow him. And essentially, that is what this 10th leper that came back was declaring. When he returned to Jesus, we read here where he fell down before Jesus. That was the posture of complete surrender but again where were the other nine now I'll 
I'll be very transparent with you. Over the years, I've became, I have become, if I'm not careful, very cynical. Because over the 50 plus years that I've been preaching, there have been so many people that the church has helped, that individual Christians have helped. And they said, oh, we appreciate that so much, preacher. You're going to see us in church next Sunday. They don't show up. You know, never see them again. I've even had some, one situation where I won't go into it in detail, but you can't believe the extent that some of us men went to to help in this situation. And then we were identified as a church that wasn't all that helpful. Why do, why do we do this? Why do we do this? When I realize they don't really want Jesus, they just want stuff. They just want help. This won't get through a tough time. So why should we bother? When we recognize a person really doesn't want Jesus at all, really doesn't want anything to do with the church, why should we bother to go ahead and help them? Because Jesus did. It's simple as that. I'm sure Jesus knew those other nine probably weren't going to come back. He knew everything, but he still helped them. And why did he do that? Why, do we, why should we do that? Well, number one, I think because others were probably watching and needed to see what Jesus was willing to do. Others may be watching us as a church, as individuals, and see if we really do care about people, if we really do love people in the community, even though they may not be identified with the Pleasant View Church of Christ. Perhaps because the lepers would remember that Jesus did, and maybe someday later on, make a decision to come and follow him. I've seen that happen too. Not often, but I've seen sometimes years on down the line when a seed was planted, somebody else came along and did some watering, and then all of a sudden the person remembered and responded. You see, every time Jesus healed somebody, it was a declaration of who he was. It was a declaration of what he had come to do. He didn't come to just heal people's bodies. He came to heal their minds their hearts, and their souls. And every time we help someone, it is a declaration of who we serve, Jesus, and what he wants to do in their lives. You know, we serve a Jesus who cares for people, but he wants to do more than just pay for their rent, get them some food, stuff like that. He wants to see, have them see who he is. And the only way he's going to have them see who he is and the love that he has if we become the hands and the feet that show those people. We have to be the ones that show the love of Jesus to others around. I believe that's why Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, In the same way, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father who is in heaven. The good that we do should always point the lost to Jesus. One of the ten lepers were healed. And he was the one probably that was only the one that was really lost. You remember there, as I read, I said, remember this? It said he was a Samaritan. Now, who were the Samaritans during that time? As far as the Jewish people were concerned, they were the low of the lowest. Uh, they were despised. They were rejected, they were sinners, they were outcasts, they were totally unworthy of any of God's love or mercy. But yet this guy's the one that came back. And he's the one that thanks Jesus. And you remember Jesus even said, was no one found to return and give to God, praise to God except this foreigner, this Samaritan? We're told that when this Samaritan saw he was healed and went back, he cried out in a loud voice. He fell before Jesus' feet. He, he give, gave thanks. He didn't write a little thank you note and uh, put it in the mail or anything like that. He didn't tell his neighbor, you know, go, I don't have time right now. Go back and tell Jesus. I really appreciate what he did for me. He was thankful. Why would he do that? Now, granted, he was thankful because he was healed from leprosy, but even more so, he was a Samaritan. And understand that he knew he really didn't deserve to be healed because he was not one of God's people. He wasn't one of the Jewish nation. Someone observed about this account, you cannot be grateful for something you feel entitled to. That's a good statement. 
You cannot be grateful for something you feel entitled to. In other words, you can't be grateful for something you think you deserve. And that's the way so many people are today. They just think they deserve everything. And that way, when they get it, they're just not thankful for anything. And I hope we're not like that. This man was truly grateful because he knew he didn't deserve to be healed. He was an outcast. He was despised. He was rejected by all the rest of the Jewish community. He was told, I'm sure, time and time again, that he was unworthy of God's love. Now, let's bring this home. Of all the people on the face of the earth, we should be most thankful because we've received something we did not deserve. Going along with Ike's communion meditation this morning, Ephesians 2, 3, and 5. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature, but our very nature, by our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everybody else. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. We did not deserve in any form or matter for Jesus to come down, take our sins upon him, and die upon the cross because of them. We were, as Scripture says, we were children of wrath. Scripture says we were dead in our trespasses. We were outcast, just as the lepers were unworthy of God's love. But he loved you. He loved me anyway. Again, it's virtually impossible to be grateful for something you feel you're entitled to, but we're not entitled to be saved. It doesn't make any difference how many generations you can go back. And say, well, my grandparents were Christians and my parents were Christians. and It makes no difference. You're responsible for yourself. We're not entitled to this whatsoever. We haven't done anything. We can't do anything physically to deserve God's love and forgiveness. That's why Scripture tells us time and time again, by grace you have been saved. Uh, someone called grace undeserved favor. Last week we talked about the Scripture, Romans 6.23. Uh, The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's why we take communion every week. We eat and drink of the Lord's Supper to remember that we don't deserve God's love, but yet he loved us anyway. We drink from the cup, and that tells us that Jesus shed his blood purposefully for our sin. We take of the loaf to remember what was done to his body, that he bore those sins, our transgressions upon himself, and every week when you and I gather at the communion table, when we have our communion meditation, we have our quiet time, I hope we recognize it's God's grace. It's a gift we don't deserve. And maybe we should fall on our face as that leper did and say, thank you, Jesus. Now, we're not told, but I'm convinced that everywhere that 10th leper, that Samaritan that was healed, I almost guarantee you he told everybody he came in contact with what Jesus had done for him. He told everybody about Jesus. Roland Allen, preacher, uh, shared an account of a veteran missionary that their church has supported for years and years and years. And that veteran missionary shared with him, he was a medical missionary. He had went to India. Uh, There was a lot of people that were born with healthy vision but had a disease, and they were slowly but surely losing their vision. He said many became blind. But there was a progress, a process that this missionary knew about that could reverse that and sometimes restore sight. And when people came to him, as a medical missionary, he performed this operation. And they would realize that a great miracle had happened in their lives. But this missionary said they couldn't say thank you. Because in their language, in their dialect, there was not a word that meant thank you. So they used another word. And he said that word literally translated was I will tell your name. 
In other words, you've done this for me. Everywhere I go, I will tell your name. I will tell what you've done for me. Well, I guess, guess the question for each one of us this morning is, are we truly thankful to Jesus for what he's done for us? And if we are, do you tell his name to others, to those you come in contact with? Let's pray. Father, we are entering that season of Thanksgiving, a great time to gather with family and friends, and next Sunday is our family here at Pleasant View. Uh, we have so much to be thankful for. Uh, if we knew you, know you as Lord and Savior, we didn't deserve Jesus dying for us. We didn't deserve all that he went through, but still you loved us, and we thank you for that. And I pray, Father, that we make a decision that as we come in contact with people, we tell your name. We let them know what you've done for us through your Son, Jesus Christ. I, I pray for boldness because the world needs to hear how much you love us and, more importantly, how much you love them. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to stand, have our hymn of decision. If you've got a decision on your heart to make, uh, we give you opportunity as we're standing and singing to come up front and join me. alone my, my hope is found he is my life my strength my soul this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are still when striving sees my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, Fullness of God in helpless pain, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. In the power of Christ, I'll 
here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Okay, you turn around now. <laughs> this is Wyatt Maggart. Most of you probably know him. And this is Kiana Dirk, his fiance. Um, but more importantly, I had the privilege a couple of weeks ago of uh, baptizing Kiana. And uh, they're up here just to reconfirm their faith in the Lord and a desire to be a part of it. So I'm going to ask you guys to hold hands here and repeat after me. I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, Jesus is Christ the, Son the Son of the living God, and He is, and he is my, personal my personal Savior. God bless you guys. <laughs> And again, like I remind you, if you're thinking of a decision like this, come and talk to Stephen or I at any time, and uh, um, we'll be glad to help lead you through this process, whether it's accepting Christ as Lord and Savior and following Him in Christian baptism or just simply putting your membership with us. A couple things very quickly. Uh, number one, Bodie Boyer is still in the hospital, so we need to continue to be in prayer for him. He came through the surgery well and all that, but they're still working on the infection and things along that line, so be in prayer for him. Cindy's sister, Susie, has been diagnosed with cancer. She's having surgery the 21st. Uh, so we ask that you be in uh, prayer for her during this time. A lot of other things are going on. Make sure you notice those. And I always like to leave on a lighter note. Um, for those of you watching online, if you were, oh, you've already shut it off. Um, <laughs> if you were watching last week, I apologize. The Ferguses so kindly informed me Someone didn't turn my microphone off last week in the last song. <laughs> Your husband. I'm like, no, no, and you, and you. And they said, we could hear you singing. I said, and it was awful, wasn't it? And Amy said, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> so I thanked her very much for being kind. So uh, uh, we're going to put a sign back there, Chris, for other people running the sound booth. Turn Booer off. <laughs> when we're singing the last song. Anyway, good to see everybody today. Hope to see all of you here next week and uh, plan on staying and enjoying our Thanksgiving fellowship time. Have a great day.